Everyone, wait, let's go. Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to tonight's uh, presentation. Uh, before we begin, I just have one quick announcement. Uh, uh, next week is our um, regular monthly meeting, and we'll have uh, Jonas uh, Dupuy of Bonsai Tonight uh, talking about um, long term development. Um, so that should be fun, so please stay tuned in for that. Um, so this year, for our uh, 2021 LSBR, LSBF Traveling Artist, we have Mr. Mike Lane here with us from sunny Florida, and uh, he'll be doing a demonstration on this beautiful African stringer fig. So uh, Mike, thank you for being here tonight, and uh, thank, thank you for back, man. Thank you, Roland. Right. And, uh, hey guys, uh, thank, thank you to the Austin Club and all its members for having me out again. Uh, this has uh, been a pretty long tour. I've been traveling since the 29th. I started out in Baton Rouge and uh, I've made it now to Austin. So I'm glad to be here. Um, today we're gonna be talking about African strangler fig, but more importantly, just tropical bonsai in general. More importantly, just bonsai in general. Um, but today's subject is an African strangler fig. This is a species that grows readily in Florida. Uh, they usually start their life uh, when a fig seed is eaten by a bird, the birds are flying around, they do what they do, and the seed ends up in the heart of a palm tree, uh, or they sometimes in a sidewalk crack or whatever it can find its way into. And all figs that are in this family, known as Eurostigma, all start life as semi-epiphytes. So they're semi-epiphytic figs that when they begin their life, they germinate in trees or in structures, and they pour aerial roots out and they absorb moisture through the air for the first few years of their life. As the roots make their way down the tree or the host plant, they make it to the ground where the tree starts taking off exponential growth and strangles the host. And so that's where the name strangler fig comes from, is they're kind of like a, a parasite in a way. They don't take any nutrients from the host tree. The host tree just eventually dies from being shaded out. Uh, but usually the, at the heart of most of these strangler figs is usually a palm tree. So uh, many different ficus species can be used uh, in banyan style. Many of the Eurostigma figs will give off aerial roots in the same way. So things like Green Island ficus, uh, all of the ficus microcarpas, um, the uh, melon seed, tiger bark, all of those. So they'll all grow in a similar fashion. <coughs> so today uh, we're going to be kind of deconstructing this tree, talking about some of the branches, talking about some issues. Um, there's actually really one big move that needs to be made on the tree that I've kind of been studying for a while. But I want to talk first about why it needs to be done, um, about what the use of doing this kind of work is, and then uh, we'll kind of do our big gigantic move. So um, if everybody can kind of see the tree, okay, I'm just going to rotate it and kind of show the character of the tree so everybody can see it. I did thin it slightly so you guys could maybe peek in there and see as I rotate it. So what we have here is three, sorry, four very large branches. Um, there's one central trunk and what looks like a secondary trunk, um, but there's no real taper to speak of in a lot of the branches, so we have some problem with that. Uh, and we don't really have good divides close to the trunk, so that's another one of the problems. Some of the branches higher in the trunk, as in like up here, have gotten really too thick to use as a, an upper branch. And so that's uh, gonna be tricky to work with, okay? So as we go through this, we're gonna be talking about what the problems will do uh, long-term and whether it's worth kind of fixing some of these problems. So the first thing that I noticed as I rotated this around was I feel strongly that this is gonna end up being the front. It has a really fantastic flare nice strong first branching or first division and the only problem seems to be this kind of buildup of branches to the back uh, that we might be able to work with but that i think is the front versus some of the other sides where they present the branches almost teed off almost at, at opposite right angles which never really looks right so uh, that's one of the areas that we have big problems why is taper important so taper is important basically because that is what your eye is used to seeing on mature trees. So if we're trying to grow a mature tree, uh, it, all trees grow old at the base. That will be the oldest portion of the tree. And the youngest portion of the tree will, uh, will be at the top. Likewise, the oldest portion of a branch will be closest to the trunk. 
and the youngest portion of a branch will be out at the ends. So it will always go old to young, old to young, or fat to skinny, fat to skinny. And so your eye knows that, all of us, every single one of us, unless you grew up in, in the Sahara Desert, we all know what a million trees look like. We have all seen tons and tons of trees. And so even if you can't put words to it and you can't express why your bonsai doesn't look like a tree, one of the reasons will be taper. That's one of the aesthetic reasons. So it's important if we want to convey a mature tree that we need to start growing taper into some of these branches. So if we're looking at this trunk, this nice robust tapering trunk here, we see that these branches, most of them, have kind of gone straight and non-tapering for far too long. So one of the corrections we, we have to do when we have branches like that is we have to find and introduce taper via a new branch, a younger branch, further back uh, on the large branch. If a branch gets too big and it becomes unusable, then you have to remove it and deal with the wound that's left behind and try and heal it. So today, I was actually thinking of something pretty dramatic. And so I was actually gonna make a pretty short tree with a much stronger taper ratio. And I'm thinking I'm actually gonna start by removing this entire chunk to the back, okay? Now, normally I wouldn't be so keen on making huge, huge wounds like that, but this tree's still pretty early in development. It's in a very large pot. We have a lot of the tools that we need to be able to heal that wound. Uh, and ficus, uh, especially strangler figs, are very, very good healers. So I have no problem with making a wound that big in this situation. Now, if we were in a bonsai pot and this strangler fig had been a bonsai for 20 years, I might rethink that decision because it's gonna be a much longer battle to heal the wound and it's gonna be a much bigger issue. I won't get the same growth in a small bonsai pot as I will in this gigantic pot. So, I'm gonna go ahead and cut this. This might take me a minute because it is a big chunk. Um, and I've just got my little baby saw. Mike, I have my other saw if you want to Well, I want to use my baby saw. <laughs> <laughs> no, I might need both, so okay, I'll, 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 I'll take it. Okay. Oops, man. Oh. I think I'm actually getting through, though. Oh, nice. Okay. It's scary looking. Uh-oh, I didn't want to cut that branch. <laughs> um, so you see we lost a lot of tree, and you won't always have to do this. You don't always have to be this aggressive. But honestly, sometimes when we make that first step, that really aggressive move, that makes everything else easier from then on. Usually when you buy new material and you have to make some big corrections, you, if you do it one time and you make the right corrections and you don't kind of flip-flop on your decision, then you do it one time and you move forward and it's done. And you won't have to do that again, not as aggressively. At least not until we get to the branches. Once we get to the branches, there will be more. Um, but that's essentially what we're gonna be working with. This is gonna be our main trunk. It has movement, so it has interest to it. It also tapers, and so we'll build our branches off of that. And we can utilize this as a very powerful first branch. Now it is low to the, low to the soil level for most styles of bonsai. But most ficus are styled as banyan style, and banyan style is usually seen as okay to have branches close to the soil, uh, as well as other parameters like having them almost barred or almost perfectly horizontal. So banyan style does get some compromises made for branch placement. But let's talk about why I removed that. Where did that big chunker go? Oh, yeah. oh thanks, man. So I figure now that I've cut it off the tree, we can kind of see it a little better. So you guys see, we have these two very large branches right across from one another. Up very high in the tree, growing to the back of these two very strong branches. And so as you guys can see, maybe you can see it better from here, but there's not a lot of, of taper to this branch here, this branch here, and even the trunk really didn't taper much. It was very tubular from there up to there. So it didn't have a very convincing taper. So even if we leave it, bigger is not better. Interesting is better. So you can have a big, boring tree, and that's not gonna be better than a small tree with interest. Um, quality is quality in bonsai, and bigger is not better. You can have, like I said, uh, there's plenty of big, mediocre trees out there, and if you wanna kinda elevate your bonsai, 
uh, don't necessarily just focus on impact achieved by size. Okay, we want to do impact by technique. So um, that's our first issue that we needed to solve. Now we're going to focus on this guy. Okay, this is our, our left branch. And now I'm not going to just cut this one back as hard, although it might not necessarily be that bad of an idea down the road. So this too has some areas where the taper is not great. Okay. However, I think it's at least usable today. Um, if it was my tree and I uh, was just doing this quickly and I needed to achieve the goal, I would just cut this and cut this and have the, the tree branch back. So we're spoiled in the tropics where our trees will readily bud back uh, even if we cut them back without any branches. And so oftentimes instead of wasting time, we'll just cut it back where the taper is lost and we'll regrow branches from that point. So a good tip when you're looking at your own trees is you will look at a tree and wherever it lacks movement or taper, that is where you're going to make your cut. Okay? So wherever the tree uh, starts to lack any kind of interest, that it goes bye-bye. Are there any questions so far? No questions yet. Well, I have a question. Where is everybody? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, also, I do want to touch on uh, strangler figs and some other figs do have a, uh, a potential allergic reaction type thing. It's called phytophotodermatitis. Um, not all people will be susceptible to it and the fig will not cause it all the time. But what can happen is if you get this sap on your hands or your uh, skin and you do not wash it off and uh, it is the right time of year, and you go outside, then you can end up getting burned, uh, really badly burned, um, by a process called phytophotodermatitis. So basically the sap gets on your skin and makes that area hypersensitive to UV light. So if you go out in the sun, then you'll get way more sunburn than you thought possible. So a quick easy fix is wash your hands afterwards uh, really, really well, wash your arms, and, uh, and just make sure that you don't work it on a day where it's full sun and you're outside just getting it all over you. Now a lot of people don't even have the reaction, so maybe it's just us in Florida. Okay. So you guys can see just cleaning that large wound and that will also be pasted. Now how do we heal a large wound like that? What's the way to heal a large wound like that? Many people feel that they'll, they'll see a sucker come off of here that they don't need or they'll see several suckers and they'll leave those things to sucker thinking that that's going to heal the wound. But then there comes a follow-up question. What are you going to do with the sucker? If you're growing a sucker off the wound to heal the wound, you eventually then have to cut the sucker, which then leaves a wound. Mm -hmm. So you can't use suckers, little satellite things, to heal the wound. The best way to heal a large trunk wound on something like this is to go from something above it and you have to run that and it will heal everything beneath it. Okay, so something up here will now need to be run long for a time to close that wound, which is no big deal. That's standard bonsai stuff in most of these countries like Jap Japan, Taiwan, Malaysia, so not a big deal. Um, so let's go ahead and work through this section. Now I do need to get through this big club of branches here. One of the things I'm always looking for when I build branches is bifurcation. So I'm looking to take my branches from one to two, and then split that to four, and split that to eight, and so on and so forth, and get the maximum amount of ramification that I can before it gets too big for the design. So I'm going to be working on trying to find the next division off of these two here, okay? And I don't need anything else. I need the next division, and then I move forward, okay? So let's go ahead. Bear with me while I find my branches. All right. Just going to have one branch on this one because the ones, the other one that would make the other side of my V 
uh, is not mm, is too far too far forward to really be usable for us. Okay, like that. Now I'll come to this guy. All right. So now this is how I wrap this. So I want to thin this juncture out to two branches. So two branches meeting from one point. And what I'm trying to ideally, in a perfect world, you'd get the wound in between the two branches where you'll then be healing the wound from two sides. So you'd be healing it from one side here at 10 o'clock and one side here at uh, 9, 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock. Um, so the reason that that's really important is a few years ago, I decided to kind of just test myself. I thought it would be easy. I said, you know what? I'm just going to try and grow a small tree without a single wound on it. And uh, what I found is about five years of studying to try and figure out how to do that. And when you think about it, if you cut off a, a large wound, you make a large wound, then on a lot of tree species, if you have one branch feeding that, a lot of times you'll have to grow that branch almost the equal size of the branch you took off. So the theory is that if you divide that into two each time and you're healing it with two branches, then you're kind of splitting that wound in two. So those branches will run out until the wound is healed. Then you will cut those and the two wounds you make will now be 50% the size of the big wound. And so you'll slowly, as you make your cuts, work it out so that there are no wounds on the tree. So you can see how that can make the process much more of a, a mental game uh, and changes the whole kind of feel of bonsai. So, so that approach alone really kind of changed how I grow my trees, uh, the techniques I use, and my entire approach to this, just by trying to heal wounds. So, let's get rid of this. Now, what I've kind of thought about how to do this demo tonight, and I thought, you know what, maybe I should just wire the branches and do, you know, what'll look good tonight. Um, but I also feel like that's been done enough times, and I feel like that's not necessarily how, how we learn the, the best way. And so even though this looks like I'm breezing through this tree, and I'm not uh, doing much to it, this is exactly how I would approach this tree at home. Um, I don't wire branches that I don't intend to keep. And I also, on my first styling, I'm usually pretty aggressive to make sure that I set the tree up uh, with the right future in mind. And I'll fill all the time with talking, don't you worry. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So we got this guy kind of uh, ready to go. So now I'm just going to pick through these guys. And the other thing I'm trying to do is clean up old stubs Trying, it, it, this trunk has a lot of old uh, stubs and old dead branches that weren't ever cleaned up. Um, so we need to go through and just kind of tidy that up, get rid of any of those dead stubs, and try to make sense of the branching. So what am I looking for on this trunk? What branches? I keep saying make sense of it. So what I'm always looking for, and, and the people in the room who are here have heard this all day, but what I'm always looking for on any tree I make is a left branch, a right branch, and a back branch have to have that minimum to make the tree three-dimensional. If I just have a left and a right, then when I turn it to the side, it's going to be very flat. Okay? Uh, so I'm going to have to have a left, a right, and a back. Minimum. So on this trunk, I'm looking for those branches. I'm trying to find at least a single left or right for you guys. Uh, left, right, back. And I'm trying to make out my, what I call architecture. The architecture to build the tree. Uh, this will also be treated as its own branch, and so this is going to be our first left branch. Now, this is the first branch slash trunk because the first branch should always be the fattest on the design. It should always be the biggest. Uh, in, in theory, that would have been the branch that would have uh, been the first one to push out on the tree and would have been there the longest, so it would have had the longest time to put on weight. So that's going to be our first branch, and our next branch, ideally, will emerge somewhere off the outside of this curve. It doesn't have to be perfect, but I like to grade my branches. You're not allowed to have branches on the inside of the curve, and you want them on the outside of the curve. I will, however, use branches that are semi-in, semi-out, and I call those B-grade branches. Those aren't my favorite. It's not the perfect branch, 
um, but I will use it and if I see something come out better, I get a better option, then I'll trade out. But that's a B grade branch. The A grade branch is right off the, uh, the, the cusp of that. Okay. So I'm looking for my right branch right here, I'm looking for my left branch right here, and I'm looking for a back branch above that. Now I don't care if the back branch comes before the, the left branch, that's irrelevant to me. Um, now you can see we do not have a right branch or a left branch, and our back branch is kind of peeking out to this side. So we're going to work with some of the branching that I feel will work long term and uh, we're going to remove some of the stuff that absolutely isn't going to do us any good. Okay? Clusters like this at the end, these are areas that really, I'm going to take care of this in one foul swoop, but if this was a tree that we were refining and you have clusters like this in your tree, this is what they always talk about, about doing proper maintenance. And people always ask me about design questions, about what's allowed in bonsai and what's not allowed in bonsai. And what I can tell you is most people uh, are not grading you on your design. Most of these professionals don't really care about what design you are trying to achieve. They don't care if you're trying to show your tree is in a hurricane or that it's underwater or anything that you want to, to convey. As long as the work was done well and it wasn't uh, done with either neglect, uh, laziness, fear, um, that, that you were confident in your design. So what does that mean? Okay, these clusters of branches it's tempting to leave those because it gives us more. It gives us more foliage today, more to look at. And when you buy a tree, you might see some silly branches where it's like this. And it's kind of coming out at a weird angle, but it fills in this area. And you just love that it fills in that area. But that doesn't matter because you, you need to grow that foliage that you love from the right place or it won't last. So if we leave this big cluster and we say, oh, but it fills in the tree and we don't do anything about it, then we're setting ourselves up like a ticking time bomb to the day when that whole thing has to come up. Whereas if you take small bites at a time and you clean it out regularly, you'll never really have to, to confront that issue. So it, yes, so nobody, nobody in this game likes going in and cutting their tree apart. Even me. And you can see I got a big uh, hole on the tree. But I don't love doing that. I do only what I have to do to kind of achieve the design I want. Uh, to kind of shrink the proportions of the tree and to accomplish bonsai the way that I'm hoping to. But I'm never happy that I have to lose density or that my tree's not going to look as good when I'm finished, but it has to be done. Otherwise, it's just that ticking time bomb and your design's not going to last anyway and you're going to have a lot of issues down the road. So big things like this, the easiest way to clean them out is thin it to two branches. Thin it to two branches, ideally at 10 and 2. So you don't want to pick two branches right here. You'd like to pick two that are opposing. Okay, and clean out everything else. Get it down to two. Think two, if I have two branches here and I don't have a trunk, then really this is going to thicken this side and this is going to thicken this side. And so it should be an even rate thickening in, in theory. If I add a third in there or a, f uh, a fourth, a fifth, and a sixth in all these areas, well now I'm definitely not going to thicken at an even rate. That area is going to get magnified and you're going to get a big ball. And so then your nice proportion, your nice tree, is going to have all these little tumors in it. And so that's when you might say for a few years, oh, it doesn't bother me, I don't care. But more often than not, from what I've seen teaching for 14 years, is it will bother you eventually. And then you'll want to fix it, and it'll be a much bigger issue. So we're going to fix it today. And whoever gets this tree won't have to worry about it, hopefully. So this might not be as aggressive as it should be. But again, I am trying to leave something for the demo. So there was nothing above that that was really usable to us. You guys can see what it was consisting of. It was really, really far out, and it had already made a giant swelling on the tree, a big ball. And so those are areas that once it forms the ball, you can't carve all that out and, and fix it because then you'll just have a big wound that will fill with scar tissue and you'll just repeat the process. So you can't just carve it out. It's got to come off and that's the only way to really fix it. And so the only way to avoid that is do proper branch maintenance on at least a yearly basis. Okay? So again, we don't say it to be mean. It's just got to be done to protect our work. So here's kind of what we're left with for the day. And that's the stuff that I would deem uh, usable for today. 
bonsai, you're not always going to buy a tree and end up with a million branches that are going to be good to leave on the tree long term. And so one thing I've been telling a lot of people, and one thing I practice a lot for Shohin bonsai, is that I have found that by starting with cuttings, a lot of times, by having oversight over the tree the entire time, you will take, uh, you might not have a tree this big at first, but while this guy is healing this wound and trying to fix this wound, you never make that wound and you never have to make a big cut because you're keeping up on the maintenance the whole time. And so in a few years, you will achieve this size with no wounds. And this guy will still be trying to heal the wound. So a lot of times, it's, it's faster to just never make the mistake, never make the, the, the flaw in the first place. I always tell people, like, when we go and we buy pre-bonsai in class, what's the first thing we always do? We cut half of it off. And we're cutting half of it off, why? Because we deem it as a flaw. And that's because we weren't there to kind of guide the tree's growth in the way that we wanted. So again, going back is sometimes if we have the option and when you're growing material at home, try to not make these kind of wounds. Try to not let them get that big. Try to address the problem beforehand, okay? So in reality, if I was at my house, I would tell you I'd probably cut this and cut this uh, just because that's the taper ratio that I like. And I may even be tempted to cut it back like that and bring out two whole new branches and rework the taper. Um, the longer I do this, the more masochistic I get, the more I want to punish myself, and the more inconsistencies bug me. It's also, once I see something, I can't unsee it. And so I might say, nope, not doing it. And then a few days later, I come out, nope, not doing it. And then eventually I do it. So today, I'm going to leave that for the, whoever gets the tree. And I'm going to try and work with what we have. Um, I do have a question. Sure. Um, Vicki Vicky Auth had asked, what is the recommended, recommended way to heal a wound of that size? Ah, great question. So if I had to heal this wound, what I would be doing is first, I'm going to paste it today. Cover it with paste. That is very, very important. The next thing is you have to run a branch somewhere on the tree. So somewhere higher than the wound, you have to let a branch run unrestricted, meaning you can't prune it. It's going to get tall and ugly and silly, but you can't prune it. And so you have to run it somewhere above that wound. And as you do, it will build callus and scar tissue on this wound. And the longer you run it, the faster it'll heal. It'll slowly crawl. Um, so other ways that you can speed up the process is maybe quarterly go in with a, a box cutter or a, a sharp knife and score the edge of the wound and repaste it, okay? Um, so you want to keep up on it and you can actually move that wound quite quickly. Where it won't heal quickly is if you are pruning the tree constantly and you are controlling the growth of the tree. So it's not going to heal nearly as fast if every time the tree grows out, we're pruning it back. So think that this tree needs to generate tissue. It has to grow tissue to heal that wound. It won't just miraculously push it up to the surface and close it. It has to seal it by building the shoulders of itself out and rolling over that wound. So in order to build that amount of tissue, you can see that you have to grow a good amount of wood. Okay? So something on here has to be allowed to grow. Okay? Ideally something... Uh, Maybe not all the way up, where you're going to disproportionately thicken the whole top, but maybe something midway up the trunk where you could build some taper. So if I thicken something midway, then it's only going to thicken from here down, which means this will stay thin, and we maintain a thin taper at the top. If I run it directly from the top, then everything under thickens. So you see that the, the theory behind that? So wherever we want to run it, it's going to thicken anything behind that. But this tree should have no problem healing that wound. No, no problem. Now, if this was a bougainvillea, I would not have made that wound. I would not have. Even if it was uh, an ugly tree afterwards, I wouldn't have made that wound. Because that would have been a big disservice, and that would have opened up a wound that likely we would never close. And it would just hollow out, and the tree's integrity would be compromised. So I wouldn't make that, that wound. But on a ficus like this, on anything I'm confident I can heal it, I have no problem. Good question. Mike Garza just asked, would you thread graft in order to get the branch placement you want? Yeah, great question. And now I wouldn't even do thread grafting. So thread grafting, believe it or not, it's, it's, it's an easy graft to understand. It's one of the hardest grafts to do. Uh, even if you've done it successfully, I can tell you there's an easier graft. And that would be approach grafting. So an approach graft is basically where you will take and saw into the trunk and place a graft right into that wound. 
and you will uh, tie it in there with tape or with a pin, you'll nail it in there and allow it to grow until it fuses into the trunk. And so you don't have to drill it through, you just make a, a saw wound that's the depth of the branch. So you just make sure that this goes in flush and make sure it doesn't move while it grows. And it will fuse super, super fast and you just cut it off just like a thread graft at the back. But you don't have to defoliate and thread it through there, break the tip and have all that frustration and uh, it's a much easier graft. So uh, yes, to answer your question, uh, I'm not opposed to doing thread grafts, but thread grafts for side branches I, I think are harder. The only time I would really do a thread graft is maybe if I needed a back branch or if I needed uh, a front branch. So the side branches, I just do an approach graft. That, hopefully that makes sense. Um, I'm not opposed also to doing scion grafting. So scion grafting is basically when the, the branch is cut off already and you would thin it out like that. You wrap it with parafilm tape and then you cut into the trunk and you stick it in the trunk and you wrap with parafilm. I wouldn't be opposed to doing that either. When I'm in development, that's the time to make all your, your big, ugly, uh, big ugly cuts, big ugly work. You do your heavy lifting. If you're in a big pot like this and I mess up a graft and it doesn't take, that wound that you're going to make is going to heal by year's end. You're not even going to know it's there. So it's one of those things that this is the time to mess with it. You can beat the heck out of the tree and it'll just keep healing as long as it's in a big pot, being fed well, and it's growing like, like all hell. But I hope, hope that answers your question. So that yeah. That kind of leads into the next question, if I could ask that one now as sure. well. Is it the right, is right now the ideal time of the year to branch, to do branch cleanup on tropicals or is it a different time in the year better? No, different time of the year is better, probably. Okay. Uh, but the benefit of tropicals is that as long as you keep them warm, you can work them throughout the year. Uh, ficus especially, they're one of the ones that, you know, I feel a little more confident working on in the winter. Um, there are tropicals that I definitely do not touch anywhere near winter. So uh, at home, buttonwoods, once we kind of get cold and I notice that they're no longer growing, I don't touch them again. I really don't even barely prune them throughout the whole year until they start growing again in May. And uh, same with other tropicals. If it's not growing, I don't, I don't mess with it. I leave it alone and I work on something that is growing, like junipers at that time. That usually coincides with when I need to work junipers. Uh, but again, ficus, very, very robust, very, very hardy trees. If I had to work anything out of season, uh, ficus is one of my go-tos. Ficus, bougainvillea, rain tree, things like that. Usually you can get away with kind of working them out of season. Uh, it's definitely by no means recommended. Um, because it just increases your work. It usually just increases your work. It just means if you get cold, you're bringing it in and out, bringing it in and out, or having to keep it indoors through winter. So I always tell my students in Florida, I'm like, if you can stand it, if you're not chomping at the bit, then uh, just ho hold off. Hold off because the work you'll do, the tree will recover a lot faster when it's growing. Uh, it'll just respond better. So it's like, why, why do the work other than to satiate your boredom? There's no real benefit to doing the work unless you're teaching a demo, and then you have to do the work. <laughs> I have to take a sip of coffee, guys. Hang on, just coffee break. Okay, um, but good questions. I'm really liking that. <laughs> okay, so just wire a few of these branches. Now let's talk, talk about wire. What's up, Lou? Well, They are not, they're not super popular. They're, um, they're, pr they're com just like anything. You, it, anything that, that is common that you can collect, people seem to be like, oh, I don't care about that. That's not that great. Uh, you know, like the tallow. We were talking about the tallow. You know, if it's common, it doesn't matter. And people won't like it. So strangler figs are everywhere in Florida. What people do like is the dwarf strangler. That's a really good species. Uh, it has a little bit smaller leaf. But Eric works with these. He has, has tons of nice ones. So why am I using such gigantic wire? Good question, Mike. Um, one of the reasons I use large wire is, there, is that I break my, my whole training into two different paradigms. So I have development techniques and I have refinement techniques. Okay, um, And so a development technique is going to be anything uh, that's going to be in the stage when we're growing things fast. Okay. So right now, if I intend to run this branch for a long period of time and it's going to get really, really fat 
and I'm not going to prune it for a while. Doesn't it make more sense to wire it with something that's a little thicker that can stay on longer without cutting in? So when uh, Juan Andrade was here in the States, and I had the luxury of working with him a few times, and I got to work with uh, my friend Seth a lot talking about this stuff, and the theory is basically changed from when I was first learning. So when I was first learning, everybody wired with half the diameter of the branch, and now, uh, according to Juan, during development, if you really want to bend things, you want to wire with the diameter or two, th or two thirds of the diameter minimum, okay, of whatever branch you're trying to bring down. Do we even have how we do? Is this the biggest? And so uh, the reason being is also, and some of us were talking about this earlier, is that a lot of the time when we break branches, it's from overcompensation. So we underwire the branch and we're bending it down and maybe we want it to sit right here. But every time we let it go, it bounces back up. So we say, okay, well, I'm just gonna bend it down a little further. And then we're hoping it bounces back right where we want it. But a lot of time that, bounce, that second bend further to try to compensate for the weak wire is what breaks the branch. So if you wire accordingly, the branch won't be fighting you as much and you won't be as inclined to really wrench it down way further than it should. I do have a question for Roland. Sure, wait. Um, oh. Mike Garz is asking, what is the history of the tree? Where did this tree come from? Oh, That's uh, you, Roland, you're up. Maybe you want to sit a little closer. Oh, sure, yeah. Yeah, uh, this tree uh, came from... Start this over. Hello, yeah, so uh, this tree came from uh, Jade Gardens, I believe, so it's been under uh, Chuck Ware's care for some time. Um, so we acquired it for uh, this demo. Um, I don't, I, I heard that he had, um, I don't know if he's on, he can correct me if I'm wrong, but I heard they had family in Florida or friends, so uh, he, he might have gotten it from, it might have came from Florida, but all I know for sure is that, yeah, it's been under Chuck's care for some time. Cool, thank you, Roland. So I'm increasing the size of the wire uh, on this one to the larger size that I didn't know we had. Okay. More so for the other side than this side. Okay, gotta have to stand. Yeah, so these are, you know, banyan style in general is, is very popular in Florida, um, working with ficus of all different kinds. And uh, that's part, that's really uh, what I like about learning in the nursery that I learned in, is that Eric didn't just kind of teach me the, some of the more traditional Japanese stuff. I also had the opportunity to learn some of these more contemporary styles. And some of those styles are kind of, you know, uh, the identity of my home. So like Banyan style, uh, I didn't grow up in Japan. I didn't grow up in the, uh, the Northwest. I didn't grow up anywhere like that. And so Banyan style is one of those styles that really speaks to me in my home. You know, we have a lot of Banyan trees all over Florida. And um, so I was telling, telling Roland earlier that one of the things that really got me into bonsai was just kind of seeing my local landscape dwarf down to a point where I could like have it in my backyard and be like, wow, that's crazy that trees that I see when I'm out fishing or when I'm out hiking, I can have one of these right here. Are there uh, wild African scraper flakes out, out there? There, there are, lots of them. We have an island called Sanibel Island. It's a barrier island and uh, it's covered with these things. Yeah, and they do, they strangle everything. But what is cool is you'll find them, like we have uh, what are called bench trees in the, in the nursery. So when you're walking around in the nursery where we have our overhead, 
you'll sometimes see like a fig that's germinated out of the table, like one of these that's germinated out of the table. And Eric, uh, he never pulls them out. He just like prunes them and he'll start pruning them for years. And so now if you walk in through there, you'll just be like, is that cascade growing out of the fence or out of the, the wood? And yeah, it is. There's tons of them. They're just, he's always been funny like that. He always like prunes the bench trees. <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. Is, is this, um, in your opinion, or everyone has kind of a different aesthetic kind of, um, you know, um, favor, I guess. Um, do you like area roots on these? Do they look pretty right with area roots? They do. I'm not a fan of, of them, and I'll tell you why. And I'm glad you brought that up. I, I practice bonsai, even though I'm, I'm not, you know, traditional Japanese. Um, I do still practice tropical bonsai from, like, the eyes of, maybe Japanese context or even Taiwanese style. And uh, so I'm looking for proportion. Like I'm not miss, I don't want to create trees that are exact replicas of natural trees in the wild necessarily. I'm more looking at it as trying to achieve proportions, the math. So that I'm a, more look at bonsai as a, a technical thing I'm trying to achieve. And so aerial roots ruin that for me. Anywhere you have an aerial root, if I get an aerial root here, right? If it drops down from here, then over time, this will start getting thicker than the branch behind it because it will start feeding more from the aerial root than it does from the trunk. And so you'll get a Popeye arm. It'll start wanting to just feed from the aerial root. And in times, we've even seen it rot away from the trunk because it gives up and just lives off the aerial root. So that's uncommon. That's a pretty uncommon thing. But um, it's not uncommon to get the Popeye root. And it's not uncommon to get reverse taper because of aerial roots. So I personally just don't deal with them. If I want the banyan look, I focus on creating a really strong nabari with lots of flaring roots. And I'm not going to have aerial roots, but I will still have strong uh, surface roots that kind of still show a similar robustness, still kind of provoke the same image. And the rest of the aesthetic of a banyan tree, I do follow. The same kind of symmetry of branching, the low profile. So banyan are usually twice as wide as they are tall. Um, so I do follow all those rules. But I, do, I don't like aerial roots. I, I just don't want to deal with the hassle that they bring uh, down the road. Oh, that makes me so sad to hear <laughs> that. Because that was my, always my tree that I wanted to eventually get was one that looked exactly like So I don't want to, OK, so let me tell you that. With that said, with that said, my teacher, Eric, loves them. He doesn't care. And there's guys in uh, Indonesia, they say, if you don't have aerial roots, you're not growing it like a ficus. And you know, if you want it to look like a banyan, have aerial roots. And so Eric has tons of trees, and you, you just deal with it. You, know, you, you work with it, you find workarounds, and you deal with it. So it's not that you can't have them. It's just, I seriously mean this, it is just me. I, myself, just don't want to have to deal with it. So I'm not trying to influence anybody else's opinion. No, I don't like them anymore. But no. <laughs> <laughs> it's just me. I don't like dealing with some of those issues. But no, Eric, Eric still loves aerial roots. And uh, you know, me and Eric, Eric is uh, my teacher and whatnot. But uh, we don't always see eye to eye on aesthetics. And there's a lot of things that I do that he thinks are silly, you know, like not liking aerial roots. So <laughs> yeah. I just remember as a kid climbing on the banyan trees. Me too, yeah. That's me too. That, that's the only, those are the trees I climbed. Like everybody else, I don't know what trees up north, what kids up north climb. But for me, it was banyan trees. Like, at, you know. Banyan trees and mango trees. <laughs> yeah. Banyan trees are really sweet. Okay. Move in. Got cut them a little lower. Scary <laughs> noise. It's all right. It's not that bad. Just helps the taste. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> well, in reality, yeah. I mean, so we—that was that portion. You guys can see. I'm not going to hide from anything. 
So you see that was the portion that didn't have a lot of taper. So I was trying to work with it and it didn't work. So no, no worse for wear. That's right, Bob, Bob Ross would say. So that's the other thing is um, I, like, I do like to kind of show if I make a mistake or you see something like that, that's the reality, I mean it happens. If you're, you're trying to bend a big branch, sometimes they uh, don't want to bend. <laughs> <laughs> they're fine. I love them. They're the best. Oh, look at that. I have no issue. I'm sorry I said anything. Aerial roots are fine. Okay. Now, do those leaves get smaller? Good question. So they do. Okay. Um, they don't get much smaller than this, however. Okay. So keep in mind, this is, this is the, the full strangler, I call it. So there's a dwarf strangler. This is the full size strangler. Um, so the leaves actually, when these are full size, you know, even this is not the full size of the leaf. Oh, wow. So they're, they're usually very large leaved uh, figs. And so this is a pretty good reduction. Now, the other thing about reduction is that we can reduce trees a lot more than we think we can if we start thinking about fertilizer in the correct way. So a lot of times I gave up on a lot of coarse species and thought, oh, you can't use that for bonsai, uh, it's too coarse. But now, fast forward several years later, learning how to slow trees down and how to uh, slow down the feeding, change how you feed them, you can dwarf down even coarse trees. Um, a lot of people shy away from big leaf trees but let me ask you something, what's going to be cooler and what, what is the, the uh, harder approach to take a tree that already has small leaves and make a bonsai or to take something that you've never seen with small leaves and then one day you see it with tiny, tiny leaves? You're gonna, it's going to blow your mind. Um, so that's really the, the essence of like really high-end bonsai is taking things that otherwise wouldn't normally be that small and showing it tiny. Um, so I still do love small leaf trees like Nia's and stuff like that. But things like sea hibiscus, that, for those who follow me, with the big, giant, goofy-looking leaves, um, those speak to me much more. You know, when I, when I see those leaves slowly reducing down, that to me feels like a larger accomplishment than even the premna. Because the premna, I just prune them and they continue to get smaller and smaller, and the more I prune them, the smaller they get. But it wasn't much more technique than that. The technique for larger leaf coarse stuff takes more thinking, more uh, more time invested and it's not as easy. It's not the low-hanging fruit. So uh, I do like working with larger leaf species and trying to master that and uh, and when you guys uh, are looking for challenges, I know not everybody's trying to make bonsai harder, but um, at a certain time when you're trying to challenge yourself, don't always take the the small leaf species. Take something and try and be the one that figures out how to use it. You know, I, I can't tell you how many times there's so many species in my own nursery that I've overlooked that have been growing for years. They've never thought to try because my odd oh, probably won't be very good. And then I see these pictures of trees uh, of that species in other countries and I'm just blown away. So it's, uh, I, I'm done trying to just cast judgment right away. Uh, I try things first, talk to people, and, and I think, you know, most trees can be bonsai with the right care. Heck yeah. Now that one is not, that one's, okay, so that is a hard subject, but I was talking, I have a, a, a buddy that I was talking to about him in Tennessee, and he's really big into Shohin, and I have a pretty cool Shohin one, but um, he said when he went to Bill Valvanus's, he saw, truly saw one with like sil silver dollar size leaves, and so that's to me the holy grail you know that's like what i'm talking about is if you ever see that a sea grape that small i've never been able to reduce my sea grape leaves that small uh, definitely not a stable reduction where it will stay that way and um, so that takes a lot of skill a lot of time kind of slowly growing it slowing the leaves down pruning them off at the right time dividing the energy at the right time See, I told you guys it wouldn't even matter. Got a new top. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, so this is the other thing too, is, is talking with uh, Juan and Seth and stuff. Uh, one of the things that they, they told me was that Japan, sometimes the, the artists in Japan or the growers in Japan feel that we baby our trees too much when we're building them, you know? And so one of the things he said is they'll, they'll wire branches and they'll bend them to just where they are about to break. And if they crack them, they don't care. They'll put cut paste in them and they'll move on because it's better that you crack the branch than be too afraid to try and get the movement you need to make it interesting. You see what I'm saying? Only the strong survive. Only the strong survive. And usually if you put paste in them, especially with things like junipers, unless it's like a catastrophic break, unless it's like all the way through, mm -hmm. if you have cambium that's still connected on the other side and you paste it, nine out of 10 times that branch will be fine. So. I've done that. Yeah, it, <laughs> it happens. It happens. Oh yeah, Mike, earlier I was asking you, uh, uh, do you have any uh, recommendations for anyone that, that will inherit this tree with the winter coming up? Oh yeah, I'm so sorry, yes. <laughs> so sorry. So you want to keep it at least above 65 degrees, so don't let it get cooler or Sorry, don't do any potting if it gets below 65 degrees. This tree can probably take down to upper 40s, but I would be protecting it in lower 50s. Okay. So if this gets into lower 50s, you should think about bringing it in. Okay, one more wire, two more wires. Um, and that's, that's pretty much all tropicals. So some tropicals, I even refer to some as hard tropicals, because there are some that can kind of take a little bit of colds that can take 50s, and there are some that really don't even like that. So like Premnas, Melina, um, Buttonwoods, those are all hard tropicals. I don't, you know, mess with them in the winter at all. They uh, really, really, really dislike the cold. And so when you think about that, even tropicals, there's a, a variation in range. So like Florida is not a true tropical climate. It's mostly subtropical, and we're far away from the equator. So some of these trees that we grow, at the nursery come from equatorial uh, countries or equatorial climate. That's an all day growth. That's a 24 hour a day growth cycle. It doesn't change ever. So those trees don't know what a season is. And so trees like that will not like the cold. But can you imagine a 24 hour, all right, not a 24 hour, but a 365 day a year grow season? Yeah. Just grow all the time. Man, your ramification would be crazy in a few years. I wish I'd lived somewhere like that. All right. Rotating, rotating. So another big problem to think about with ficus, and that uh, almost ruined ficus as a landscape tree a few years ago in Florida, is the pest known as ficus whitefly. So whitefly is a very common pest, arguably the most common pest for ficus, and um, they can really do damage to the tree very quickly. So whitefly, usually you'll check the underside of the leaf, and you see this one, there's a, a few white spots. That's probably residual of like whitefly. So you just spray with a pesticide and keep it away. It's a pretty easy pest to treat. You just gotta treat it, that's all. But most ficus have whitefly. Uh, even if they're in your yard. And um, so again, like you just gotta keep the pesticide on hand and if they get it, you gotta treat them. What was the tree you recommended earlier, Tall Star? Tall Star is what I would use for white fly, yeah. And the miticide? Is Avid. And those are really honestly the only two things that I use unless I need to break out a fungicide, which for us in the tropics isn't often. You know, we don't have, uh, most of the tropical trees aren't too, too prone to, to fungus issues where we're at. I better not, you know, I'm bending this branch and I need to learn my lesson. <laughs> enough is enough. Okay. Yeah, stab it. <laughs> Leave me alone. Okay. I use a Bayer 3 in one for that, most of my That's stuff. pretty good. Yep, it's not the it's not as good as Tall Star, but it's uh, it's it's the best over the counter that I think from okay. that you can get. You just want to usually stay away. I I feel 
I stay away from most oil-based uh, pesticides because I work things like buttonwoods do not like oils and certain trees are very, very um, sensitive to sprays. So I only ever use things that I know are safe and I can only tell you this, is I've used Tallstar for years, years and years and years, and uh, I've never had an issue with it. So I've never hurt a tree with it. I've sprayed it at, in the middle of uh, the heat of summer, the hottest part of the day. Uh, I've done it all, all, all times on every species we have in the nursery and never had it have a negative reaction. So now, do we have any cut paste at all? Okay. Why, thank you, sir. I'll take the, the gooey. The gooey. The goo. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. So I like to use the gooey stuff for when I have big cuts. Um, somebody was asking earlier, you know, when do you use which cut paste? And the answer is you use whatever cut paste you like, whatever cut paste has the application that works best for you. So usually there's going to be clays and, and, um, and pastes. So this is like a wet paste and this is obviously much easier to cover a large wound than it is to sit and sculpt the putty onto it. Thank you, sir. That's smart using the popsicle sticks. That is smart. So why do we use paste? Um, paste is basically just a seal to keep moisture around the cut site, keep it from drying out. So if you think, if I had a wound, if I cut myself, and the margins of that cut dry out and die, then the wound gets bigger before it ever gets smaller. And the same thing happens for plants. If it, the wound dries out, then the wound will actually get bigger on the margins. It will die out a little further than you cut it, and you will start with a bigger wound uh, than you made. Slightly, won't be a, a big difference, but you will have a bigger wound than what you had originally cut. Um, so I don't like to do that. Okay, I, like, I do like to do this though, this is fun. <laughs> it's like pudding. Um, so it seals in moisture as well. The cut paste holds the moisture uh, in the wound, keeps it from drying out. And in theory, a lot of these supposedly have hormone in them that also encourage the uh, buildup of scar tissue. Now, I'm, I don't know. I haven't ever tested them, um, but that's what they all kind of state, a lot of the Japanese ones is that they contain hormone that will help it heal. And so you see I cover the entire wound. I want to make sure it's completely covered. And now I'm going to do that with the rest of them. And so I didn't believe in cut paste. When I first got into bonsai, I thought, you know, it was just kind of one of those extra things that you had to buy. And um, I didn't use it for many, many years. And I'll tell you, in hindsight, there's a lot of wounds that could have healed a lot faster if I'd used cut paste. When a tree is growing quick, too, I've had sea hibiscus where I've made big wounds, big wounds. And because I've been running the branches for so long and had so much vigor in the tree, and I pasted that wound, and I'm not joking, it, probably th three, maybe four weeks, I've had silver dollar size wounds close on sea hibiscus, completely close. And uh, now I've also had it where I've made those similar size wounds on sea hibiscus, and they didn't close. And the difference was the vigor that was in the tree. Okay, the cut paste also helps, helps kind of get that initial rollover. But if you're doing this work too, while the tree is super, super vigorous, you'll be shocked at how fast it starts crawling across that, that uh, wound. So it happens very, very quick. Ah. Roland, yes, I do get it on my finger. <laughs> <laughs> he was asking me earlier if I care if I get it on my finger. The answer is yes. 
<laughs> try not to, but it happens. I try not to, but it's gross. I've always put it on my finger. Really? Yeah, I just never, like, with the putty, I've never, like, licked it. Like, <laughs> oh, yeah. They li oh, the putty, I lick, yeah. yeah. I, I realized after a while, I don't know why it never occurred to me, but I was like, maybe I shouldn't be licking on people's trees, you know? <laughs> yeah. I'd, like, go to customers' houses, and I'd be like, oh, we're going to put cup of <laughs> They're probably like not touching the tree for a week. <laughs> like, oh man. Well, cause I, I think that I heard that those tanks they have some uh, endobutyric acid, which, which can, um, it can, uh, it does something with the cells and you know can lead to cancer. But I mean, it's well, let me tell you this about bonsai and all the chemicals. Um, <laughs> they all lead to cancer. <laughs> Yeah, there's yeah, not one. Fungicide. Right. I'm sure some of the tools you're using are have metals in them that lead to cancer. Yeah. You're now getting away. <laughs> no one's getting out of here alive. <laughs> Good point, man. Yeah, man, there. Yeah. Yeah, when we were when we were kids, they'd fog for mosquitoes. You know, they'd they'd send the 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 little car, yeah, those yeah. those trucks, and they like fog out the streets, and we'd run and play in it. Yeah. We'd be like, oh, it's so fun, Following you know, along. which explains why you know I make certain bonsai decisions, but <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. Back in the day when we didn't need seatbelts in the back. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Maybe all the kids in the back of pick Had a. Pickup that was when we had to escort. <laughs> yeah. We really did. I mean, I remember like when that was like when cars could still only have lap belts. You know? <laughs> yeah, man. That was before. The, no, they didn't even come up with the the shoulder strap yet. <laughs> you fall asleep in the back. They hit the brakes. You just kind of roll. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean. Uh, no, I'm not that old, but I do remember that. I mean, I legitimately we had an escort, and that thing, uh, all it had was belt, belt, but. Uh, Seat belts, the uh, lap belts. I remember thinking like it would be great if I just sat down and my seat belt went over me. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah, remember when that was a thing? It would go. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, after a while, it would get like it was like my car would get mad at me, and I'd open the door and it'd be like. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like, damn, this is a That's fun. Design. <laughs> so, we, so yeah, so. The old days. <laughs> okay. All right, guys. Back in my day. Back in my day. All right. So, yes, humble beginnings. So, what are we looking for on this tree long term? Again, I'm going to kind of show you guys, hopefully. So, we're looking to get a branch ideally here. We're looking for a branch ideally there. And we're looking to get one to the back as well. Over here, we need a branch to fill in this other part of the fork. So I need to go one to two. This guy, I'm already divided to four, so then I need to divide each one of these. So one thing that also helped me out with bonsai design was I always got confused with when to do what. I was saying that to Summer earlier. And so one thing that kind of helped me was A, first re recognizing what my goal was. What is the goal? What does this work do? What are we working towards? So the goal um, that I started working towards was to divide my branches as many times as possible before I reach the end of the design, okay? And so my divide uh, theory is one to two to four to eight to 16 to so on and so forth. And the tighter I get those divides, the closer they come to the trunk and the tighter I stack them together, the more divides I can fit by the time I reach the edge of the design, okay? So then when I'm going through my tree, I now know clearly what I need to work on. As I go through, I check where it's dividing, and if it hasn't divided, what do I need to do? Divide it. i got to prune it. Now, that also couples with all the other theories. Horticulture, is the branch healthy enough to divide yet? Is it the thickness I want to divide yet? All that plays into it. But if the answer is yes, then you prune it, and you cut it, and you divide that branch. And so that's what I'm looking to do, is continue to build on my math. I look at my one to two to four to eight, and I look for deficiencies. Where am I lacking a branch? How do I get that branch there? 
Okay? So as I go through the tree, I'm noting deficiencies. Need a branch here. Need a branch here. Maybe need a branch down here that comes out that would create the first fork off the design. Um, I definitely, like I said, need a branch there. This whole top needs to divide several times to give us all the branches we need to fill out the tree. And we build it just like we would anything else. I, I like to tell people the way I, I stop. Okay, all right, I'm not, not saying bad words. Um, so talking about that architecture. So up here, we need a ton of divides to kind of finish out the design. Uh, and the ways that I would encourage that, I would be feeding the tree very heavily. I would be first before I make any cuts. So if I wanted this to, to definitely butt out where I want it to butt out, and I want to ensure that when I cut this, nothing happens, I let this run for a while. Think of it as gassing the branch up. You're putting fuel into the branch so that when you cut it, you're going to have enough energy that it responds how you want it to. Okay? So this is going to need to have that happen several, several times. Um, lastly, uh, finished pot. When do you finally go to refinement? When, when do you decide to take it out of this pot? Uh, you kind of make that call because think of it like this. You want to do as much of your bulk work and you want to save as much time as possible. So whenever you convert to slow growth, it's going to take a lot longer to achieve the same uh, things that you have been achieving. So for instance, do I need to wait and grow 100 inner nodes in this trunk to get the branches I need to build design? I don't need 200 branches, so do I need 200 nodes? No. So this is an area I can grow fast. I can work on growing the trunk with, with strong fertilizers, big pots, no problem. Likewise, the first primary branches. Do I need 100 internodes in those? The answer is no. I probably don't need 100 internodes. So those can probably be grown fast for a while. Several stages of those can be grown fast. Now, when you finally start to get to when the branches are getting difficult to wire and divide and find room for them, that might be a good time to start refining the tree and slowing it down. That's when you will build the last part of your details, and that's when you'll start potting the tree down to a smaller pot. That's when you'll start feeding it slower, and that's when you'll start with a much more regimented pruning regime. You'll be pruning the thing all the time. You'll be partially defoliating all the time. So that's another thing that, that's a big difference uh, between how I approach bonsai and how a lot of other guys approach bonsai, is I don't really fully defoliate for any other reason than aesthetics. I won't fully defoliate. It does nothing in my mind, horticulturally, that benefits the tree. I know a lot of artists do it, and I know they make great trees, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's the best technique and that there isn't one that's better. And so I'll tell you the, the way that I've really found a lot of success is by doing a three-stage defoliation where the strongest growth is fully defoliated, the growth that is showing medium vigor is left with two to four leaves, and the weakest growth is untouched. And so what that does is balances the energy in the tree. The strong growth is now weakened because all the leaves have been taken off and now it cannot generate energy and must now use stored energy to grow back. The medium is in a semi-state like that. It's now not generating nearly as much as it was. And the weak now gets an opportunity to catch up and become the strong. So by doing that, by balancing the vigor too, you, you save your work because when you prune, you don't have the likelihood of that branch might die, this one will live. That branch could die, this one will live. Everything will be uh, fed and treated equally by the tree because they'll all have the same amount of vigor. So I don't agree with full defoliation and taking off weak buds at the, the same time you take off everything else. Uh, it has not worked well for me. And so doing that partial defoliation, spreading the vigor out throughout the tree, then makes every other choice, every other hard pruning easier. Okay, um, I've talked a lot today and through my trip through Texas on my feelings on bonsai and that we are a curator here. Our job first and foremost is to care for the tree and get it as healthy as possible and hopefully 
one thing that'll help is fall in love with your tree before you start working on it. Love it as just an, an ugly project, okay? Think of it as, I just wanted a strangler fig, and it just so happens it looks cool. And it just so happens we're going to make it look cooler. But ultimately, if it was just a strangler fig, you shouldn't feel any other way about it. We should still just care for trees. And so if you start approaching it that way and you start making the choices for the tree and not necessarily always for what you want to see, you'll actually get what you want to see quicker. It's like a weird Zen lesson. It really is. You have to put off what you want and the tree will respond better and give you what you want. Weird. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, are there any questions out there? Um, we don't have uh, any questions there. No questions. All right, okay, all right, okay. We're ready to wrap up, so. What kind of, um... Pot? <laughs> yeah, I'll Good. square oval. No, uh, so, so I like uh, ovals for these guys, shallow ovals. I don't mind a rectangle, um, but I do like shallow ovals. I think they uh, kind of present well with the, the wide, broad stance of a banyan style. So I do like that. Um, it's popular in Taiwan to use like deeper, uh, e deeper rectangle pots. You'll see a lot of that with paintings, paintings on them, landscape scenes and stuff like that. Um, I do like that aesthetic, but I think I still prefer just a nice, clean, shallow oval. I think that's my favorite for banyan trees. Um, it just uh, really seems to speak to those aerial roots if you're going to have them. And even if you don't, I just think it really lays out that broad triangle really well. So yeah, no worries. What, what's your, I know it's, it's not a super black and white question, but what's your kind of go mix for um, when we're trying to put these in a... Oh, great, great question. Okay, so great question. So the question is, uh, what kind of soil do I use? What kind of soil do, would I put this in? So I, I approach everything in my bonsai, as I've been saying, in that, that three-part paradigm. So. The, it's health, development, and refinement. So if I purchase a tree, the first thing I do with that tree is assess the health of it. So I look at the roots, look at the growth, look at how it's been uh, fertilized in the past, look if it needs to be repotted, and before I make any styling decisions, I work on that and get the tree happy and healthy and gassed up for the work to come. Then comes development, and now I'm going to answer your question. Development is where we're doing our heavy lifting, and so everything changes, even the way we water the tree. If you want your tree to grow the fastest, the fastest possible way, then you need to be watering it under a wet, dry cycle. Meaning that you need to water this tree completely so that it drains out the bottom and exchanges gases, and then it's up to you to not water that tree again until it starts to dry down. That tree needs to dry down a bit. And then you repeat the process and water down again. And what that does is as that water uh, starts to drain out off the top, roots start to explore deeper areas of the pot you start to get what's called coarse root growth because they're exploring. And so coarse root growth leads to coarse branch growth. Okay? That's what we want in development. We're not worried about fine internodes. We want fast growth, vigor. We want a lot of energy. So I usually use a coarse mix. A coarser mix will grow your tree faster with coarser nodes. So I will use, uh, typically in the nursery, we use uh, expanded shale, lava, and Eric recommends in a little pine bark. Now, I've recently kind of switched. If I want a really coarse medium, I'll grow in straight pumice. I don't mind. Or I'll, I'll mix in maybe a little bit of river sand, a little bit of akadama, and a majority pumice. Um, when I get to refinement, that's where akadama really comes into play. So akadama's property is a water retention amendment. So it will retain more moisture in the soil is one of its benefits. There are a few others. But that's primarily what it does. It's there, you amend more akadama in to hold more moisture. And that's called the wet-wet cycle. And think of any tree you've ever seen that's sitting in a, in a ponding state, even cypress. Uh, when they're submerged in water, they're not going to grow as fast. They're never going to grow as fast as if they get a wet-dry cycle. So you can use that to your advantage when you get to refinement. Trees at these top-end bonsai nurseries are often in refinement, watered consistently more throughout the day and are potted in a mix that holds more moisture. So uh, that will keep the tree growing slowly. So it's a different mix. Currently, I'm using uh, an imported blend that's river sand mixed with akadama. It's Kiryu river sand mixed with akadama 
And then if I need it coarser, then I amend in more pumice. And so that's been a, a really good way of kind of treating the trees. Yeah, Thanks, yeah, buddy. no worries. Any other questions? How are we doing for time? Uh, we're, we're doing good. Uh, we can, we can, uh, we can run to uh, 8.30 if anyone has any more questions. If not, then we can uh, uh, conclude this evening presentation if there's no more questions. I'm just trying to see if there are. Yeah, see if there's any more questions. Okay. Uh, yeah. Great question. Uh, I was going to, <laughs> I was going to mention that at, at the end of the presentation. But yeah, um, we're gonna raffle off this tree at uh, next week's regular meeting. Uh, so, um, and the way we do that is uh, usually um, you just uh, you uh, see how many tickets you want, and we put it in a um, in a uh, what do you call those things? The the random number generator. And uh, yeah, and then you hopefully you're lucky and uh, you get to go with the tree. So, but that'll be yeah, next week. Uh, we figured um, wait till then when we have a more more attendance at the at the regular meetings and uh, yeah. You got to just get the lottery ball it's thing. The lottery ball. Yeah, that's got all the balls. <laughs> so yeah, so that'll that'll be yeah. So just uh, show up at the meeting and yeah, and try your luck at that. So thank and, you for that. Question. And so I do really think that this this can be a really really good tree. Uh, I think it has great movement, great proportions, and a fantastic nabari. Uh, you know, if somebody out there gets the tree and they don't like the strangler fig foliage, it is a ficus, so you can graft other foliage to it. You can find dwarf strangler fig, graft it to that. Uh, so there's a lot of fun things you can do. You can find other strangler figs and fuse them to this trunk if you needed to, build out bigger proportions by fusing other trees in there. So uh, it's a really, really fun, interesting tree to play with. Uh, just remember to wash your hands after working with it, uh, especially in the time of the year where the sun is the most extreme. That seems to be when it's a big issue. It's not so much an issue uh, in the cooler months or even in the spring. It's mostly when that sun is really beaten down. And from what I've read, these kind of uh, increase the production of the chemical that causes the, uh, the phytophotodermatitis. So it shouldn't be a real issue. I've only had it happen to me one time in the years of working with this, but full disclosure for anybody getting this tree, I wouldn't want anybody to be caught off guard or not know what they're dealing with. So it does have some potential for an allergic reaction. Uh, but other than that, uh, whoever gets this tree, you should uh, have a pretty good tree here in a few years. Do we have any other questions? Uh, if you were gonna try and, could you try to root that giant Oh, absolutely, and your odds of, of rooting a larger cutting like this are pretty good because this does have roots on it, so it does have large, uh, some aerial roots on it, and so if you brought those in contact with the soil and defoliated this, there's a high likelihood that this cutting will live. The other benefit is uh, counterintuitively, oftentimes large cuttings are more likely to strike than thin cuttings because there's a lot more juice in here. There's a lot more energy and it's less likely to dry out first, uh, it's more likely to push roots before it dries out, if that makes sense. So this is, uh, if anybody, if any of the viewers would like this cutting, no, I'm kidding. It's going to somebody here, you had to be live. No, uh, but this is something, you could actually even break it down into several parts, you know, break it down into that big part, break it down into that part, break it down into that part, um, and make several cuttings out of it. As you guys can see, it was a, a pretty large inconsistency for the tree, and it was difficult to work with this as a, as a branch that high up in the tree. So sometimes you have to make hard decisions, and uh, it's okay. You know, you gotta do what you gotta do. So, you gotta let it go. You gotta let it go. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so hopefully you guys kinda get out there and work with some of your ficus, hopefully, and, Hopefully those of you who have been maybe grappling with the decision of making a hard cut or were afraid to do it, uh, hopefully this encourages you to kind of bite the bullet and kind of cross that, that plateau maybe that some of us have been hanging out on. Yeah. So uh, any other questions so far? No, I think, uh, I think that's it. Uh, everyone, thanks so much for being here tonight. Mike, thanks again for visiting us. And, uh, 
yeah, we'd love to have you back soon. So, yeah, everyone, um, we'll see you all next week. And uh, you all have a good night. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Austin. Thank you. See you guys next time.